tuning in to watch this video. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for new punk rock videos every week and tap the bell to get notified when new videos drop. This video was brought to you by The Coldest Water Bottle. You can check the link in my description to win one of these water bottles or for 10% off all your purchases. My name is Erin McClough and I'm here with Mr. Jared Watson from Dirty Heads. How are you? I'm doing very well. <laughs> Super humble and like 
that is just always, it's really nice when you meet somebody that you've looked up to or that you're kind of like, oh, I, I want to do that one day or something, you know? And you meet them and they're real. They're still a real human being. Um, being in a music video that he was doing with um, Yellow Wolf and like Tim Armstrong. And I remember it was just like we were filming in the upstairs room of the Roxy and it was so fucking hot, like dripping yeah, sweat. My yeah. makeup was running. It gets swampy up there. Yeah, my makeup there, was like much. running and he was behind the drums and he had his fan and like we were on like a break between filming. Um, and he just like points his fan at me because he saw that I was like dying. <laughs> yeah, you know? he's and just I was a cool like, dude. <laughs> yeah, he's just, he's just a cool dude. Like it, it was immediately comfortable, you know, and it was cool that he cared about the song and he really liked the song and, and we know how busy he was and, or busy he is and the, kind of the caliber of, of I don't want to say celebrity, but where you know, success Travis has had, yeah. um, that was never felt. You know, it was like, hey, we got to shoot a music video in a week, and he's yeah. like, cool, I'll be there. And he yeah. was there, and he worked. And you know what I'm saying? He's still, he's still in it. He's still like, he's down for the culture. He's down for music. He's just, he's a great example to, to follow. Yeah, I mean, I've I've run into him, you know, because we run in the same circles so many times since from 2012 to now, so almost 10 years, and every time. He's consistently been extremely humble, has never changed. He's always just been like, oh, hey, how's it going? Like, yeah. what's up? You know, how's yeah. this? Like, and he remembers things about people and he's just like that really kind, humble person. And it's it's not fake. That's just like no. who he is. No, that, that, that shit is not fake, especially in this industry. You can tell what's fake and what's not. And Amy, it's the same with Amy and Kevin. Like, they're the best people. I love them so much. Like I cannot say enough good things about them and they're just real and they're humble and they write great music and it's just such a good vibe to be in a crew with people like Travis and Amy and Kevin to where everybody wants everybody to win. Yeah. You know, there was no ego. There was no, you know, I need this. I, you need this. Everybody needs more. Somebody's trying to get this. I mean, it was just like with, with Travis and Amy and and Kevin, it was just like family. It was just like, we're all in it so that we can all help each other out. And that's just, yeah. it's really great to have people like that around. So I heard in another interview that you said, like, obviously that line of, about, you know, the dad line is like, you and daddy are, are really, really close with your dad. Yeah. So you didn't feel comfortable with that. So that was Denim that wrote that or? Yeah, that was Mac. Yeah, that was Denim that wrote that. And I was like, ah, because so then at that point, it's like, do we change that lyric? Yeah. You know, do we change that lyric? But there was something so strong and powerful about that lyric uh, that I was like, we can't change this. We yeah. can't touch this. This is such a well-written chorus. And um, if if we didn't get Amy, we wouldn't have done the song. Yeah. You know, but at that point, it's it's it was more of, like I understand that it's a dirty head song featuring Amy, but it could have gone anyway. Yeah. Like that's how I look at it. It's just coming out on our our best of like, but that song could have been a single for Travis for Interrupters for us. So I just look at it as it's kind of all of our song, and it's just getting put out now through our channels, I guess you know. But it's really all of our songs. It's not necessarily just like this so straightforward Dirty Head song. We just had Amy hop on, you know. So that was yeah. that was really cool. It just it's you got to be careful with things like that. You know, I've done it in the past and it's, you got to be careful with, with singing a certain way, a type of way, singing lyrics that, that may not mean something to you, but you know, they work. And yeah. then you'll go through the motions and you'll think, Oh, this is going to be, you know, such a, this is going to be great. And it's going to help us. And it's going to be such a great song, but is it really you? Yeah. You know, is it really you? And we've done that. And I'm like, man, this isn't me. I'm, I, I, it's not a regret in any way, but it's just something you learn to where it's like, yeah. I'm not going to sing certain things a certain way because they're not me and I'm not going to say certain things or yeah, I'm just not going to say things that I don't feel are natural to me, yeah. but I'm 100% not going to get in the way of the song because of that. Yeah. You can either I walk away from the song or if it makes sense with somebody else, then great. Well, I would imagine too that, you know, with something like that, if it's not you, and the song is a hit, then like, you know, 15, 20 years later, when you still have to perform yeah. that, yeah. you're gonna have yeah. a hard time yeah. with it.
I mean, I don't mind singing it live because it's like I, the rest. It's just that line, and the rest of the lyrics can. I, I mean, like. I've been, we've been through a lot. I think anybody that just lives life, life is not easy. So the rest of the lyrics I can totally connect with. So it's yeah. not hard. And once we're on stage, I, everybody understands. And I want people to hear the songs. Like, we're not going to play it live. It's like, no, we'll play it live. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not faking the funk on that one. But it, and it's super, super fun live. And we've been playing it. And it's been going over really well. So we're stoked. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen like the Instagram stories of it and kind of how... You know, you have the whole band kind of singing on it because obviously Amy's not there to sing her parts. Yeah, no. <laughs> I wish. I wish. Maybe, maybe some shows. Maybe. She will. She'll. She's gonna come out. They're gonna come out. Kevin and Amy are definitely gonna come out. But it would have been cool. Wasn't there one night where you guys were like on the tour that you just kind of wrapped? You were in the same city at the same time, but yes. they're doing the Hell Omega tour right now, and you're which doing... is locked the fuck down. And I understand that because they're like, hey, we're gonna be in Houston. We get off stage at six. Yeah. You guys play at 9.45, we're going to be there, we were so stoked. A couple days later, Kevin was like, hey man, <laughs> we can't go. And I was like, I kind of know, right? Like you can't really be going to another show, and then like trying, maybe somebody's going to get sick, and then all the crew gets sick, and then the bands yeah. get sick, and then Green Day gets sick, and then everybody gets sick. I was like, <laughs> I got it, it's all good. <laughs> we'll, we'll make it happen eventually. Kevin just like stays in his hotel room. I've seen all his Writes stories music. too. And yeah. he's like, he has his whole massive working setup. Yeah, which just... is <laughs> fantastic. He, and he's so talented. I yeah. mean, he's so, so talented. So, but I love that guy. Yeah, it's cool to it's cool to see how they've grown because I remember, you know, being in one of their first music videos. Like Tim texted me and was like, hey, come out. Like, you know, my this band, is like the interrupters, come, come be in it. You know? Yeah. Um, and it was like this backyard thing and it was when they were like brand new. First single album hadn't even dropped yet and to see you know how their career has has grown yeah um it's just been like insane yeah and it says a lot about his work ethic and their work ethic that he's still out i mean rome does it um sublime with rome he does it a lot of guys do it i think it's really smart uh to bring a rig a recording rig out on the road and yeah. you can work on music there it's i really respect it because i I don't really like it. Like when I'm on the road, I'm on the road and it's like yes. show time and yeah. I get in like this swing of things where I just kind of have my habits throughout the day. I wake up, I work out, I do the ice bath and I do breath work <laughs> and I do this and then, and then it's time to warm up with Ruben and Mark and then, you know, it's just like my day is like I kind of am OCD about how I like my day and then days off, it's like I really do need the day off. You know, I don't want, I can't, I don't want to sing. Yeah. Um, I want to kind of just be alone and, and decompress and stuff like that. So, it's definitely happened before, but I have a lot of respect for guys like that where Kevin's like, no days off. And I'm like, I love that. I love that you, it's not everybody's path, right? Uh, yeah. I love that, that they can do that and he can do that. It just shows like their work ethic. Yeah. I like to come home and work my ass off. And then when I'm on the road, I, it's like, show, studio, show, studio. You know, I haven't really successfully married him yet, but I don't know if I will. Yeah, and well, you know, and that's why Kevin is like, he's like literally the guy that has like been everywhere and you didn't even know it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, totally. It's like, Jesus, Kevin, what are you yeah. doing? Yeah. Well, so speaking of denim, you guys actually did a song a few months ago, right? Mm -hmm. The song Khalifa's. Yes. Um, which I love, it's great. Yeah. Can you talk about how that happened? Like, how did you guys start working together? I saw he actually opened Bayfest um, like last month mm -hmm. in San Diego. Yeah, so he hit me up on Instagram and uh, it's, actually really fun when people hit you up on Instagram because it's either going to be good yeah. or it's going to be not so good. That's how we're here. Like it's gonna be, <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. But like usually it's like, Hey, can you check, like, can you check out my band? And it's like, Oh, here we go. And like, yeah, I'd love to hear your band. And sometimes you're like, man, that's great. You know, good shit. And sometimes you're like, good job, you know, keep going. Like, you know, I'll never say anything bad, but cool, man, you made me practice a little bit more. I'll give people pointers, but what the fuck do I know, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's usually really fun. And Denim hit me up and he said, hey, can you listen to my music? And I heard it and I was like, who the fuck is this kid? And he's like, I live in Huntington. I was like, the talent, if this kid is real, like, okay, come, we came down to the beach, we hung out with our families for a little bit. We, we became buddies, got in the studio. And the talent was like real, like yeah. super real. I was like, oh, this is, none of this shit's faked. And we just became buddies and we were driving to the studio to go work on a song. We didn't know, we didn't have any ideas. And he was like, hey, I have this idea. Uh, it's this Misfits song, it's this intro. I really like it. And he showed it to me and he was like, we're kind of 
spitballing what you could do with it because I was like, well, I'm not gonna be on like this punk song, but we ended on this like big build to drop into some like very heavy like kind of Beastie Boys hip hop stuff. And I've never heard a song like Khalifa's before. The the structure I've never heard before. Yeah. A lot of um, I just this I think the structure is the main thing. And people have mashed up, like especially in your world, people have mashed and Travis's world, people have mashed up like old punk yeah. and hip hop before, right? But the way that that this song like turned out, I was just like, man, this is unique as fuck. Yeah. It's probably one of my favorite songs I've been a part of, uh, you know, just to be a feature on. I was super stoked, honored, you know. I love that song. It's one of my favorite songs, I think, that we've released in a while. No, it's really great. Like, I found it um, when I was prepping for this interview. I was just kind of digging around on YouTube, and I was like, oh, that's, that's that guy. I, I saw his name from Bayfest, and I didn't reach out for an interview at Bayfest because my day was kind of stacked already. Yeah. And now I'm like kind of regretting it. I was like, oh, this, and like I started listening to his music as well. I was like, this guy is really, he's really good. good. Yeah, he's really he's good. really good. Yeah, and he's the real deal. Walks the walk. Like I got in the studio and he started singing and I was like, shh, you <laughs> definitely don't need any auto-tune for this motherfucker. <laughs> like everything was, was on point and he produces really quickly and we just worked really well together. It was super fun. I love that song. Well, so where was the music video film? Because the beginning of it looks like the desert, but then the rest of it looks like the beach. Did they just like take the beach sand dunes? No, like... we actually just shot it out front here in my car in that Pontiac out front. So we were just on PCH. Okay. But the desert, we went out to Glamis, okay. and, which is like this kind of just this dirt bike, like sand rail party zone that like I've, I, I've known about since like high school. Everybody used to go there in high school for spring break. And they kept calling it something else. And I was like, I think we're going to Glamis. And they kept calling it something else. And I was like, dude, we got there. I was like, bro, this is Glamis. Like, you told me, this is like five hours away. Because <laughs> like, halfway there, I was like, wait, why are we not there yet? I thought we were only driving like an hour or two. And they're like, no, 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 we're going out to the spot. So like, it was cool, though. I ate a bunch of mushrooms and walked around the desert for a while. Like, because he's like, you're going to be the shaman guy in the shot. And I was like, let me get into character. So I was just like, yump, yump, yump. <laughs> mushrooms on you at all times I like I like <laughs> I mean it's the cameras there they're not legal yet here but uh yeah 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 I've been uh I got a lot of friends that 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 grow and uh they've been helping a lot of people you know yeah. a lot of people have been microdosing I just and, did it uh, on Sunday it was great yeah it's great and, uh, cool yeah, party. yeah I usually got some mushrooms <laughs> on me either on my persons or somewhere no they are it is like a whole healing thing like it really is um, and more people are getting turned on to it for the healing purposes. And yeah, which is great. I mean, psychedelics, I think, is it's a very tainted word. Like, the English language is kind of like, it's just, I, I feel like there's a lot of stigma that pu people put on the word psychedelic. So, kind of, yeah. I kind of hate that word. Yeah. But what, if we had the research that we had now, when, you know, in the 50s to now, like, we'd be so far ahead and pharmaceuticals would be different and they'd be a lot healthier, in my opinion. Uh, I'm not an expert, but it has helped me a lot. It's helped a lot of people. I understand psychedelics for, like, party reasons yeah. and social reasons and things like that. That's fun. That's not where I'm at now. Um, I'm yeah. definitely using them for kind of growth and healing. And it, in my experience, they've been really, really great. You know, a, a lot of different, a lot of different psychedelics, whether it's DMT, 5-MeO or mushrooms or ketamine, but usually it's assisted. 
I think that's what's, what's really cool is that actual PhD doctors, actual therapists, actual psychiatrists, they are willing now to be like, come here, come to my spot and it can be supervised and we can get really good quality and I can be there with you and I can guide you through this and then we can have a therapy session while we're doing it or afterwards or a couple days afterwards rather than just like your buddy giving you massive amounts of DMT 5-MeO on accident. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Life-changing experience that I didn't know was going to happen. So there's a difference between DMT and DMT 5-MeO. Okay. And my buddy was like, hey, and I was like, man, I've never really broken through on DMT. I've had great times. I've done it, you know, a couple dozen times. It's great. He's like, I can get you through. I can definitely get you through. So he gets some and he comes over and he doses me very, very high, like extremely high just for normal DMT. And DMT 5-MeO is like Mount Everest type shit. It's different. Okay. It's an added molecule. And we, neither of us knew. So okay. like, let's just say it was a... Uh, very terrifying, very beautiful, and a life-changing experience for the better. And I'm very glad that it happened. And I'm kind of glad it happened without me knowing that that's <laughs> what I was getting into, right? Okay. Um, well, so, like, what kind of breakthroughs did you have on, on that? Do you, like... It's a, that'd be a whole other interview. <laughs> okay. You know, that'd be a whole other interview. But okay. I'm just saying, <laughs> having a guide uh, that yeah. knows what they're using or um, that knows how to and to... to to, to just guide you, whether it's an actual doctor or not. You know, there, there's people out there that you can go to now, and I think that's really, really healthy. I think talk therapy is great, but I think adding, in my personal opinion, in, in, uh, and, and it's not for everybody, I understand that, um, but I do think psychedelics can help speed up uh, some therapies. You can, you can figure out a lot of stuff with psychedelics that might take you years and years with yeah. just talk therapy. Yeah, when I, I did a video about this like two months ago, I, I did like a Mexico adventure. Um, it was my freedom trip like post-divorce of like working through all of that. And I traveling, I had met people and they're like, go up to this mountain town called San Jose del Pacifico. And I love like, this already. I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> and like, they're like, it is the magic mushroom town. Everybody goes there for the magic mushrooms. They grow um, naturally there and the local people are not involved with cartels. So it's a business for them without having to like deal with, you know, the cartels in Mexico cool. and it, it's like what everybody goes there for. So I went and you go to the, I went to this like store, I videoed it all for educational purposes. Sure. On, it's on YouTube and it was like, they're fresh mushrooms. Also, they're not dried. And it was like, I walked in and there's this little Mexican lady named Ruby and her fucking son is there. Like I like walk in and I'm like, hi, I, I'm, I'm here for Ruby. Like I wanted to buy some mushrooms and the this kid's like, mama. Like, <laughs> she comes out of the back. Yeah, no, she does. a little apron. And I was like, are you Ruby? And she's like, yeah. And, like, I asked if I could film it. And she just got this table of, like, so many mushrooms. And they were huge. They were, like, this tall and, like, this big. And she sells me, like, like seven. You know? And I'm like, I'm like, this lady's out of her goddamn mind. I'm not right. eating this many. So I ate half and then half the next night. And it was just like, yeah, it is an experience. And, like, you know, I, I agree with you in that. And I also think that you have to kind of work through some of your stuff. You can't rely totally on the drugs, but the like drugs can help. Agreed completely. I, I, I agree with that statement. I think that's there. Yeah. Very, um, so I go to, um, <laughs> she's kind of like a life coach breath work, um, woman that I see. And I think I stole this from Rogan and one of the psychedelic guys on Rogan, but it's my favorite thing to tell people. So, She's like, you don't need psychedelics to get to this to the state that you want to, that, that psychedelics can get you. You can get there through breath work. You can get there through meditation. And yeah. I, I understand that. I agree. You can do that. There will it, it, it might be a healthier way for a lot of people, but it does take a lot of time. It takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of discipline. And yeah. there was this, you know, this saying where this Buddhist monk goes up to Buddha and he says, Buddha, I've done it. I've finally done it. And he's very, very old. And he, I've been practicing my whole life. I've been meditating. I can finally walk on water and I can cross that raging river. Yeah. And Buddha's like, that's great, but you can also pay the ferryman a nickel. And he just takes you across. So like, that's kind of like, it's the best way to think of, but yeah. also that ferry ride is going to be fucking terrifying. Yeah. It's going to be the scariest fucking ferry ride you've ever had. And you might face some shit that you don't want to. And walking across it when you've, when you've gotten... I like the fact that if you've worked up to that to where you can do it on your own without psychedelics or drugs, it's probably going to be a different experience, right? It might even be more pleasant, but like 
psychedelics make you, they force you to face things that you don't know that you needed to face. And I, yeah. I like that. I, I have, there's something in me that thinks suffering is self self suffering is beautiful you know suffering is not beautiful it sucks but when you are purposely doing it to yourself and it's something that you're setting up I, I think that whether it's physical like working out or mental or just growth or looking inside yourself you have to kind of suffer you have to face the shit you don't want to face you have to do the reps that you don't want to do you have to run the mile that you don't want to run and when that's done that fucking feeling is unbeatable there's no other drug out there that can give it to you that you're just taking to get rid of these problems or whatever just on a social level like i'm going to take these drugs i'm going to do this i'm going to drink or whatever there's no better feeling than, than than coming out of a heavy trip and learning something or pushing your body so far and that you feel like you're going to throw up and then feeling great on the other side you know i, I just yeah. there's something really beautiful about about suffering yeah i mean it, there there are both like i feel you on that with like the long ways of the therapy like i I went to Cambodia and went through that as well. And it was like, I did it all sober with an energy healer. And I remember why he, he, that motherfucker, he says to me, how do you feel today? And I was like, Prasad, what the fuck did you do to me? <laughs> yeah. I was like, he unraveled me. Yeah, and man. It was like, and it was just like, so, but yeah, there is like the fast way. And then there's like, well, that was kind of fast too. But they were, I mean, it was just all kinds of awful. They're both fucking awful. 100%. <laughs> 100%. But it's great. But it's like you, I would, you know, it's like that awful that you look back on. And you're like, I'm so glad that I did that. Because yeah. I would... Because you overcame. Yeah, and it's like an <laughs> awful that you, it's like these terrible things that you don't know you have inside your body or in your mind or in your brain, and you're spilling over onto your friends and your family in a yeah. negative way, but you have no idea that they're there, and so when you can kind of get those and get fucking rid of them, or not even get rid of them, keep them. Keep them and say hi. Keep them and give them hugs every once in a while. Like, live it. Like, I love that. Sometimes you just feel shitty. Feel shitty. Those emotions yeah. are real. Live yeah. with the shittiness. Live with the anxiety. Live with the depression. Like, listen to it. See what it's saying. Like, actually, don't try and get rid of it, you know? Even with happiness, it's so easy to sit in negativity. It's so, so easy to sit in the negative emotions and the anxiety. It's really hard to sit in the joy. Yeah. You know, most people, oh, my God, why is this good thing happening to me? Ugh. You kill it, right? Or, oh, my God, something bad's going to happen. Yeah. You know, like no. Own, like, yeah, if you can make the negativity big, then try and make the joy big, you know? When we had started our work, he had said something to me that was, like, it always stuck with me. He goes you know, to clean a room, first you have to take everything out. And that's kind of like what these processes are, is it's like you're like purging all of these like fucking demons. It's yeah, like and you're gonna find some moldy <laughs> shit, like some weird jello cup that's got shit growing in it, and you're like, oh, there's a dead squirrel over there, that's why that smells. Why does that dead squirrel look like my mom? No, I'm just kidding. I don't have any mom issues. Maybe that's the but mushroom But yeah, style. but don't... Say this, I learned this from the DMT 5-MEO trip. Do not trifle with psychedelics. That was a big lesson that they taught me. It was like, hey, don't fucking trifle with psychedelics. And I was like, okay. So I just want to say that. So like that in what way? Just they're not to be fucking trifled with. They're not, they're just not like, you can hear people in conversations and be like, I'm going to go do that. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do that. You might not be ready. It might fuck you up. A lot of people say you, you know? have to be in like a good, somewhat of a good mental space before kind of you know, dosing. Maybe, maybe, um, I, or be with people that you trust. Like if, when people, yeah, like a yeah, shaman. yeah, <laughs> definitely. But I, sometimes there's something about like not being in a good space and doing it, like having those really bad trips. I feel like those are when you learn the most, That's right? You just need to watch it. I just, so I just <laughs> know that like, I got a big message when I was doing DMT five and and it was like, Hey, like, and I, I even, I thought about it before we started talking about it. it just even, I, I was like, maybe I shouldn't talk about this in an interview. Because the message was like, hey, man, you don't, you're not like this psychedelic guy that knows everything. Stop giving everybody fucking microdosing mushrooms. You know, like, you don't know what you're talking about. This isn't to be trifled with. It's just not something that everybody can just go do. And it's all good. And I was like, yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes, guys. 
So. Well, so what was it that kind of led you, you know, to this transformation? Because obviously you, you don't drink anymore. You yeah. cut out the pills and you, you know, moved into this, this healthier space. Like I, I even saw on your Instagram a couple of weeks ago, you posted like, you know, a side by side photo of you when you were. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like versus now. And like the transformation is huge. It, it was that, um, you know, not knowing that that was some sort of trauma, just like not knowing getting sober, because I'm California sober now. I just don't drink, right? Um, <laughs> I just don't do what I know that I'm, you know, is not good for me. Yeah. Uh, but it was hard. It was really hard. I was eating a lot of fucking painkillers and drinking a lot of booze, like, you yeah. know, before I got out of bed, to get out of bed uh, for many, 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 many years. And that does a lot, you know, of damage on your brain and your body. And coming off of that, is really hard. It took me a couple years and I didn't really, you know, I was kind of like ashamed. First off, I was just ashamed that I got to this point and then getting through it, it's just kind of, you kind of beat yourself up, you know? And uh, I didn't know that that was going to, I thought I was just going to get clean, get dry and everything would go back to normal. But no, that's no. not how it works, you know? <laughs> no. I didn't know that. So, um, it was like a and, cleansing process yeah, of like and, emotional like physical cleansing. Yeah, and so much more stuff came up. And then on top of that, you have to kind of relearn how to live life without any crutches or without, you know, these things that when something, you know, goes bad, pills, booze, I feel great. There's no problems. You know, there's like this whole relearning of how to live life. And that's, that's a lot. And um, I found through exercise, through therapy, and through the psychedelics that I've used guided, um, they've been really, really helpful. Um, more so helpful than some of just the talk therapy the psychedelics have been. Yeah. So I'm not taking psychedelics just to go get fucked up and like see some wacky shit and just rage. Like I'm, you know, using them in the way that I think is the right way, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's, it's okay to go do that, but yeah. not for me. There's right a now. difference of like, I personally, I've done them in a party environment and then I've done them in a healing way. And like, Sometimes it's just like, if, you know, doing it with people that are partying, it's not the same experience because they're not trying to have an enlightened experience. They just want to get fucked up. Yeah. And I think you can have some of the greatest nights of your life and that's fine. I don't think that that's what they're here on this planet for. Yeah, for sure. Well, so for you two, I saw, you know, you're into the Wim Hof um, and you're, you're training to get certified, right? Yeah. With that. Yeah. So during the pandemic, I was just like, it's like, I'm sure a lot of people went through this. It was like, what? okay, I can either sit here and just continue to binge Netflix and Hulu and HBO Max and like all my subscriptions or like, man, I should probably learn Spanish. I should probably learn a skill. I should probably do that at my house. Like, so I was like, what do I want to do? What do I really like doing? What am I passionate about? What do I, what do I think would be cool to learn? Yeah. Um, and I was like, well, I really love breath work. Like I'm really into breath work. Um, so there was a course online that you could get for Wim Hof and I'm like, little over halfway done with it now yeah and then i think you once you're done with it then you can reach out to them and go see them in person and you can actually get certified i don't know if i'm going to go that far and it's not for like so i can do classes and make money i just think if i'm going to there's been a couple times where people have wanted me to run them through it yeah and a lot of it's very simple but also with breath work it can bring up a lot of things like just one time it really can it's a very real thing like i remember when i was in cambodia it was the end of like the meditation of working with that energy healer before we started the real work and it was just like a yoga class and like it, we were having like a really deep meditation and he could, like cracked me open i started crying yeah. and i was like the fuck yeah <laughs> that the, the feelings the it's kind of good fuck? though you're like why does this feel so good yeah no because it was it, i was like the beginning of a lot but oh, it, okay. that's where okay. he was just like and that was you know, it's, but it's a thing. I'm like, you know, it, it is dangerous. And especially if you have no fucking idea yeah, why or right. like, and you're not expecting it, it was like, could somebody have warned me this might have happened? Exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. Just wanna, I don't happening? want to be in one of those situations and not know how to, how to get out of it or help them out of it. It is yeah. like breathing is such like a powerful thing. Like, I said, I wish that could stay here because I feel like summer's gone. We can walk through the ocean. And see if we the rising sun So unpack your bags of things No more running from town to town And now that we've arrived so safely Baby, you can
with that with the same thing is like a, a, a lot of shit coming up or just something happening that I didn't know was going to happen during the breath work was I did an hour long breath work uh, guided and like 30 minutes into it bawling out of nowhere. I was like, why am I crying? Like, this is insane. And I just cried for like 20 minutes. And it was like, <laughs> your my body's pulsating. I'm like having this psychedelic experience and I'm just bawling my eyes out. And then for a good 20, 25 minutes and no, and no like pinpoint emotion. Like no, I don't, it wasn't sadness. It wasn't anger. It wasn't happiness. It was like, I couldn't pinpoint what emotion it was. It was just pure emotion. And I cried for like 25 minutes and I got done and I was like, I never felt better in my whole entire life. You know, I feel like yeah, growing like, up, let it out. yeah, like growing up in the culture that I grew up in, growing up with the friends that I grew up with grow, and not blaming them at all. I'm really glad that I'm the, the person that I am now. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with growing up with, with the dad that I have, who's a great guy, but like they're all manly men, you know, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. But crying wasn't a fucking thing that we do. You know, emotions aren't a thing we fucking talk about, you know, yeah. like being in pain and all these things, you shut the fuck up and go on with your day. And like, there's something I admire about that. And there's something that I still think that, that, that is 100% okay with that. But there, it gets to a point where, like I said, when you spill over, if it gets to the point where it's just spilling over, cause you're so bottled up with it, you need some sort of release. And I think that breath work is a really safe way of doing that. If you do it right, it's, um, it's not so scary as maybe like some talk therapy or something that people think because you're not just like, okay, I know what we're going to talk about today. Or, you know, it's just like you can, like I said, it, was no, it wasn't it was one thing um, that, that I was dealing with that made me, you know, sob uncontrollably for 25 minutes. It was just like euphoria and then this sadness and then more euphoria and like, or not sadness and then just this crying. And like, it was just, it was a crazy experience. But as a man that, goes through life and and you know the whole kind of thing is just man up and kind of walk it off uh I think that there's other ways that we can kind of do that yeah and I don't I mean yeah obviously it's mostly men that that's geared to but even even women it's like totally you know, for it, sure like it's just our society and like western culture is like you know it, we're taught to suppress things and then you know treat it with pharmaceuticals and yeah <laughs> it's very like nuclear family, like 1950s, you know, and it just doesn't make much sense to me. Like that's what it's, 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 I'm glad that there is, that it's getting more accepted. I'm glad that meditation is getting more accepted. Mindfulness is getting more accepted. Breath work is getting more accepted and it's becoming part of a culture. Uh, but it's just like, there's that little bitterness where you're like, who, what those fucking rich white guys in the 50s are like psychedelics are bad and this is fucking woo woo and it's like <laughs> fuck you and it's like take these pills give us more money take these pills give us more money take these pills give us more money you know it's just like fuck you you know we'd be so farther along as a society I feel if that didn't happen but it did yeah what are you gonna do yeah well I mean yeah it's there's obviously conflicting viewpoints on all of this but um <laughs> yeah I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about by the way don't like don't use me I don't I'm in agreement with you, yeah. but you know, we could argue this all goddamn day. Right. Uh, so let's get back to the music for everybody watching that doesn't give a shit about psychedelics. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. <laughs> I could talk about psychedelics all yeah. day too because they're fucking fun. And yeah. I've had the same positive experiences yes. with yes. them, yes. but you know, for everybody watching that has not, um, yeah. <laughs> go try them. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I did not say that. <laughs> I did. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> well, so. Um, you guys, I saw that, what, you're working on a new Dirty Heads album. You've got, like, nine songs done already, yeah. right? Yeah, hell yeah. We're super stoked. I mean, it's been done for a while. So we got nine done. We took off Headspace and Rage for it. So we'll probably do two more, maybe a third. Um, and we're really excited for people to hear it. We, Our big concern was, like, hey, what if we listen back and we don't like it or it feels dated, which is not going to happen. We listen back. I listen back all the time, and I'm like, man, I fucking love these songs. So we're really excited. That'll probably come out hopefully next summer. And the reason why that got pushed back was vacation. This massive vacation fucking blow up that came out of nowhere in the middle of the pandemic. We're super stoked. Uh, we do, if you're a Dirty Heads fan and you're watching, w trust us. Like, we get it. We understand that this song has been shoved down your throat 
We understand it's been shoved down our throat. We understand that everybody has heard this song a million times. We get that. We know that there's remixes and there's another <laughs> remix coming out for Latin America. And it's the Spanish version with this guy, John Z. We fucking know. Like, we know, but also, like, we're reaching other countries we're reaching other people so we have to ride this wave but we are mindful of not overdoing it so you know like we, we get it we get it we 100 get it trust me rage is the only fucking song i care about right now <laughs> um we understand that that's that's happening but vacation happened and the label was like hey we want to do a best of and then we said fuck no what yeah. are you talking about like, like what do you what do you mean uh we're not that old we don't have greatest hits in our eyes. We have so much work to do. We have some great songs, but like, why are we going to do this? This doesn't feel right. And they came back with a really brilliant idea that, that once they, they pitched it, they were like, hey, listen, you're getting a lot of people coming to your channels right now that don't know who you are. Let's give them a starting point. I know there's the essentials on Apple and the, on Spotify, and you can look up the top ones, but are those really the, the best ones? Are those really the ones that we want to show people because there's still like Sloth's Revenge and there's other songs that, that may not be in the top 10, right? Uh, so I thought it was a great idea. It's just like, hey, if you're a new fan and you're coming here, here's this best of, and you can kind of get like who we are as a band. And when they pitched that, I was like, that's actually a great idea, but we also are sitting on a lot of new music and we really want to put it out. So we'll do that if you put out Rage and another new song on it. So it was a compromise with the label and I think it was really great. I think it was really smart of them. Uh, and I'm, I'm super stoked on it. Uh, so that just came out. And that's what pushed the new album. But it's coming. Yeah. And I'm excited to do a couple new songs. Because now I have like even more of an idea of the three songs that we want to do. Like, do we want to do more reggae heavy? Like, we're playing Oxygen, Oxygen every single night. Like, just goes so hard. Yeah. And we haven't really... You know, a lot of people lump us into the reggae rock world. And we understand why. <coughs> but... At the end of the day, are we a, a reggae band? I don't think so, no. you know? Um, but we do have those influences, and there are songs that are very reggae heavy, and I don't think we've done one in a while. We did Supermoon with Dave Cobb, and that was pretty far away from it, so it feels like it would be cool to do a couple more reggae-leaning songs, like especially with Ruben and Mark now, the yeah. two horn players, which they're fucking awesome. If you haven't seen their show now, we have two <laughs> new horn players that sing and play horns, and they're bonkers, and it just makes our show even better now. Uh, so yeah, that's where we're at. The new album's coming out hopefully next summer. Every single day, cause I love my occupation. Hey, I'm on vacation. 
process when you're kind of forming these songs and fine-tuning them like mm. I, I did hear in another interview you did you were talking about like the creative process of when you hit a wall it's best to kind of change location so that like you don't <laughs> yeah my car is is like this it's magic I don't know what I, I don't know I don't, I don't want to think into too much of it why but for some reason when I get stuck if I drive it's like vomit you know, just creative vomit. It's like that's, sometimes I need to just take a break from it and I don't want to go drive because I don't even want to think about it. But when I am in, in work mode and I'm stuck, if I go get in my car and just kind of drive around, it's just like, maybe because I'm driving mm -hmm. and I have to concentrate on driving. So it kind of takes you away and you're not only focusing on it. It kind of like lets you, I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, like I'm, I'm concentrating on one thing, so I'm not thinking too hard on it. And that might be the problem is I'm just overthinking everything or something. Right. But there's something about driving that like just always kind of gets the writer's block going. And from the beginning of, of ideas, it could be anything from a song title, a lyric that I have written down that I thought was clever or something that inspired me from a movie quote or, uh, a song that I heard that had like a musical lick that was really catchy or a sample that we want to use or a guitar riff that Duddy has and he comes in with a bunch of ideas. It could be a drum beat, it could be anything. But usually I'm looking for a musical hook. I'm, us I'm looking for a riff or I'm looking for a lick. Yeah. And that's super, super catchy that we can build off from there. That's usually how I like to start songs. For sure. Yeah. And so I want to touch back on the vacation stuff. Again. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I get it. We that was that. actually in the pandemic how I got turned on to you guys. Hey, I, see what I'm saying? It's I know. And so it was, I, I knew your songs before, but I didn't know they were you. Like, obviously I was familiar with Lay Me Down um, and, you know, some of your other, other bigger hits that, you know, were on the radio and that was just like, you just couldn't get around them. But it was like, I remember in the pandemic, I was scrolling through Instagram one day and it was like, there's, you know, this page influencers in the wild. Yeah. It was like this really um, voluptuous woman on the beach, and she ha she was in like the aerial like um, ropes, you know, and she was Sick. she was hanging upside down twirling. I love it. Around, I love it. And they had done vacation over. She's a legend. Good. <laughs> She's a fucking legend. And I, I was that. like, what the fuck is this? And then I was like, oh, this song is actually really good. And like, I think it was like. I feel like your that song hit in the pandemic because everybody was just so fucking miserable, and it was like a really positive song. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like <laughs> one, it's the, like one, it's talking about vacation, and during the pandemic, that's all anybody wanted to do. <clears throat> Two, the message behind it, like if you are happy in your life, and you do love your job, like why won't you want? That's you're gonna want to get behind that. Three, if you're not happy, it's kind of like a call to arms, like go fucking change it. And I think yeah. a lot of people during the pandemic looked at their lives and were like, hey man, I, got, I have a really good life. I'm very lucky. Or they're like, hey, fuck this. Fuck this rat race. Fuck how society's set up. Fuck these motherfuckers like up at the top just making us do all this shit. You know, like there was just the right time, right place type of song. Yeah. Right, because it's four years old, and when it cracked, like with our fans at the beginning, radio wouldn't play it. Nobody would touch it. And I was like, ah, it's all, it's okay, it's good, it's this, that, you know, excuse, yeah. excuse, excuse. It's like, okay, but when we play it live, that's how we gauge songs. When we play this song fucking live, we're ending the show with this song. This was four years ago. We're ending the show with this song because it's so popular with our fans. Yeah. So our fans knew what was up. We knew it was a good song. Cut four years. We're like, okay, it's four years old. We'll move on. You know, we just keep writing songs. Is what yeah. we do. And vacation gets a hold of it, and I fucking love social media for that. I, it's just a, a different animal, and it might have taken a while from like illegally downloading and Napster and all that <laughs> shit to for bands to see the pros of social media and streaming. Because yeah. at first it seemed like it was just a lot of cons. You're losing all your money, yeah. uh, you know, whatever. Pick pick whatever fucking con. But now it's like. You don't really need a label. You can do it all yourself. Yeah. People can find you. It's in the hands of the fucking fans. It's literally in the hands of the people. They are choosing what songs are good. It doesn't matter how old, how new, whatever. It's just if people like it, it it'll blow up. Yes, there's a lot more competition. It's more saturated, but people are going to find you when, you know, when we were buying CDs, like there was like 12 
alternative bands. It was like Metallica, Red Hot Chili Peppers, like Nirvana, you know, was, yeah. and that was it. And there's probably a hundred thousand bands yeah. that were just as good that are, that will never be heard. Yeah. Because it was just labels putting out these big bands and dumping all their money into it. And now people can put music out and it doesn't matter if you're in your bedroom or not, you still have a chance, right? Yeah. So there's like, it's just a lot of cool stuff and the right time and the right place, that's, we really believe in, in consistency, yeah. hard work and consistency. We know the talents there. We know the songs there. We know we have something unique and special. Like we're very confident in the band and our music, right? So mm -hmm. as long as we just keep doing it, something's gonna line up eventually, right? Yeah. I think like with Macklemore and Thrift Shop and then uh, the, um, the LGBTQ song that like blew up, what the fuck was the name of it? Um, he went on Ellen and played it. It was like everything kind of lined up for what he was speaking about, you know, and, yeah. and the people that he was getting behind and like the whole culture that he was getting behind. Like there's just, you see these instances of like, he didn't, he wasn't taking advantage. You know, he wasn't like, oh, what's hot in the news right now? Yeah. Gay rights? Okay, let me write a song about gay rights. Let me get on that. And people fucking do that now, but that's not what happened with him. You know, he was like, that was just a truth that he was speaking. And it just so happened that it lined up. So like, I feel like that's what happened with Vacation. It was just a song that we had and it was just one of those things where it's like, we got lucky because we're so consistent. Like if, if, if you buy a lottery ticket every day, right? Mm -hmm. You have a better chance than somebody of not buying a lottery ticket, but you still have a chance of not, right? Yeah. But you still have a better chance. So if you think of working at whatever goal you're going towards, every single time is buying a lottery ticket. Like every time I write a song, it's a new lottery ticket. Every time I go for a run, it's a new lottery ticket. Every time. Yeah. I, you know, do a vocal warm up. It's a new, I'm just constantly buying these fucking lottery tickets all day and it's work. Every single lottery tickets work, but you're, you're going to have a better chance of that finally landing, yeah, you know, and the then the spaghetti like, method of like throw it against the wall and see which one sticks. I love the spaghetti <laughs> method. Yeah, <laughs> sure. beginning part yeah all right yes. i was walking my dog that giant 90 pound dog outside and it was like uh you know i'm in the wetlands it's a nice day it's sunny i'm like whistling i'm having a great day and it literally came out of nowhere i think i had the the, the lyric and it was like a i thought it was i maybe think it was for a verse like a rap mm -hmm. Like, hey, I'm on vacation every single day because I love my occupation, but it didn't have any melody to it. But I was like walking my dog and like, this is a great day and like smelling flowers. I was just like, hey, hey, hey. And then like, it literally came out of fucking that. I was just like, okay. And, and so I've said this in interviews before. Uh, you might've heard me. We have this thing called ugly baby syndrome, right? Okay. And looking back at my child when she was eight months old, I definitely had it. I thought my child was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, but she looked like an absolute just hillbilly trucker. When I look back, I'm like, oh my God, who's that giant fat baby that looks like a man that drives a Mack truck? It happens with music. It happens with your ideas. Just because it's your idea does not mean it's good. So a lot of the times you would go in the studio and be like, dude, I have this dope idea. And you would show the guys and they'd be like, eee. you'd be like, what? I, that's so fucking dope. It's like, oh, <laughs> why is it dope? Is it dope because you made it? And you're like, oh, I think I like it just because I came up with it, right? 
You can't like things just because you came up with them. So They're who not was wrong on that one then? Who hated it? No, me. <laughs> oh, you hated it. I just didn't know if it was an ugly baby or not. I was like, because hey, it's very elementary. You know, it's like, it's simple. And I got, I got, I understood. I'm like, this is catchy as fuck. But it's also very simple. You know, there's like this fine line that I walk of like, is it too easy? Is it too simple? Can we make it like, I don't know. And I was like, hey, guys, I just got this idea. It's like, it could be an ugly baby. So you, you walk in, and, I, and we always just preface it with a, hey, man, I might have an ugly baby. Could be super fucking stupid. So that my ego is already out of the question. You know, it's, yeah. it's already, out of the, already out of the picture. I'm walking in. I'm like, is, this can be dumb or this can be cool. You guys will now decide. I think it's cool, but if you guys say it's not cool, it's probably not, and then I'll let it go. And I showed the guys. Uh, it was Duddy and Jonah, uh, Jonas, actually, the producer. And both of them were like, yo. Yeah. I fuck with this. And then Jonas started playing the piano and the melody came and then we got the guys in and they all played their parts. And the next thing you know, that, that was the song, but I was just walking my dog in the field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. All right. No, it, it is. It is it's it's a thing. So lastly, I want to talk about Sword Beach. You, oh, sick. You, okay. You've been saying that you have the songs. They're recorded. They're ready. What's the holdup? Okay. So that's a lie. I lied. Uh, you lied. You lied on the, 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 the podcast with Duddy. That was where you were saying, like, eight months ago, you're all like, they're ready. Well, they they're are. Done. They, they, they were. So I started releasing them just once every month. And then Dirty Heads is always going to take priority. Yeah. Forever. And I'm sorry if you're a Sword Beach fan. I don't think there's people out there that like Sword Beach more than Dirty Heads. If there are, I'm fucking sorry. I'm honored. <laughs> that's crazy. But. Uh, you know, I released a lot of them. There's a couple now that I don't know if I want to release because now I'm like, man, this, is, this isn't this is up to the standard. Uh, but there's a brand new one that I just finished. I okay. just finished and we just got the artwork. I posted the artwork a couple weeks ago. It is coming out in a couple weeks. It's called Overlord. So there is a new Sword Beach song coming out in a couple weeks called Overlord. I swear it's in, it's in the system. Okay. Like it will be up soon. Uh, okay. I can't remember the release date. Uh, but I think it's in like two to four weeks at the most. Um, so I released like six. And I think I had like nine. And those other three, I don't think I'm going to release. Why? I just don't think they're good enough. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good reason too. I mean, yeah. if you don't feel like it's your best work, like best not to put it out than put out something that is like maybe crap. Yeah, they're not <laughs> crap. You just don't, you just don't feel it's good. just a different thing now. It's become a different thing in my mind now. And it's such a passion project that it's nice to be like, no. You don't have to. I don't fucking, being, I don't have to do anything. Yeah, you're you not do whatever, being pressured. Yeah, like I can make the artwork the way that I want to make the artwork. It can be based around things that I'm a fan of, whether it's been done a million times, not been done a million times. Uh, it's just so cool to just kind of show like just m the things I'm passionate about behind closed doors uh, in, in music and in artwork and in aesthetic and, and it might change over time. Well, it's for sure going to change over time, but it's just so fun. Like to like, you know, if you walked into somebody's house and like you see like kind of their geek shit, you know, like yeah. their figure, like you collect cards or you collect figurines. You're like, you know, what, are you, or what are you doing? Like, is that a little table where you're painting Gundams? Like, what are you doing? Like, oh, I, like I had to, like, there's this thing with, I'm a bitter anime nerd. Okay. Like, hands down, I'm just a bitter anime nerd. So, growing up in the 90s, anime was not cool at all in any groups. Like, small, very small groups, like in my art class, right? Yeah. Nobody thought anime was cool. So, I had to hide it. <laughs> I had to like hide my anime fandom. And I, you know, I was going to go art school. I was like obsessed with anime. I still am. And now, which is good. I'm glad. I'm being very hipster right now. Everybody fucking loves it. Every SoundCloud rapper has used it for their fucking artwork. It's, it's fucking everywhere Even now. like Megan the Stallion talks about anime. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's like, okay. It's yeah, like if yeah. Megan is saying it, yeah. it's okay. And everybody's <laughs> jumping on the trend. But I get why everybody's jumping on the trend because it's so fucking good. I mean, there's, yeah. a, there's Akira is in my top three top films of all time. Not anime films, just top films. Like Akira is one of the greatest films of all time. And if you think about how much pop culture has been taken from Akira, it's batshit. Like you, you will... You don't know until you've seen it, and you'll be like, oh my God, so many people ripped this off, right? Like, it's, I get it that it, it might be a trend now, but I understand why it's a trend, and I just, like, I'm just a little bitter because I used to, like, I had to hide it and, like, not let people know that I liked it, that it's lame or whatever, you know? And now it's, like, so mainstream and so cool, and everybody likes it, 
but I can't let that stop me from from loving it or, or putting out or having that aesthetic be part of Sword Beach or anything that I do, you know? For sure. But I'm bitter. <laughs> You know, it's like jocks are showing up to fucking Comic-Con now as like superheroes. And you're like, fuck you. You used to make fun of these kids in the, in the, you know, in high school. And now you're showing up because it's cool. Now the Comic-Con dress is fucking, you know, the Hulk or whatever, fucking Deadpool. It's like, all right, come on, man. Yeah. You weren't a day one guy. Like you just, now you watch the movies, do you? You know everything about the MCU? Okay. Get it. Well, I'm going to close with that and say thank you so much for taking the time today. I'm sorry. Funny? No, that's the greatest thing ever. I'm sorry that I just had to get all bitter, no, like I... nerd bitter. What's up? This is Jared from the Dirty Heads. You are watching Last Rockers TV. Last Rockers TV.